Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah, Yahweh is salvation, was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, He prophesied for some 54 years from about 740 to 686 BC. And he prophesied under four of the 20 kings in the southern kingdom. He prophesied under Uzziah, the 10th king, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the 13th king. All of these were good kings, of course, except for Ahaz. Ahaz was an evil king. In fact, during his reign, uh, the northern kingdom called Israel had gone into Assyrian captivity. Now, as we come to Isaiah chapter 5, we come to a, a chapter that is affectionately referred to as the Song of Isaiah. The Song of Isaiah. It's a song to God, about God, regarding the vineyard of God. And the vineyard speaks of the children of Israel and specifically the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, if you're taking notes or outlining our study today, uh, we've divided chapter 5 into three very simple sections in dealing with God's vineyard. The first section is a parable about God's vineyard. That's in verses 1 through 7. The second section is a pronouncement against God's vineyard in verses 8 through 23. And the third and final section is the punishment for God's vineyard. That's in verses 24 through 30. Now let's drop back and take a look at this first section. It's a parable about God's vineyard, which of course points to and speaks of the children of Israel, basically, but the southern tribe of Judah, practically. And we'd mention three things about this parable of God's vineyard. Uh, Number one, the first thing involves the care for his vineyard in verses one and two. Verses one and two speaks of God's care for his vineyard. Take a look. In Isaiah 5.1, it says, Now let me sing to my well-beloved, speaking of God, a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, cleared out its stones, which is no small feat, by the way, in Israel, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a tower in its midst to keep it safe and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but, but it brought forth wild grapes. Now, as we've mentioned, the beloved or the well-beloved is God. The vineyard is Judah. And as we go through the text, we're going to see that Israel and Judah, uh, the two names are often used interchangeably. But God's children, Israel or Judah, if you will, of course is referred to as God's vineyard, God's vine, God's seed. In fact, in Psalm 80, verse 8, David said, you have brought a vine out of Egypt, speaking of bringing them out of Egyptian captivity. You have cast out the nations, speaking of the land of Canaan, and planted it. Jeremiah 2.21. God said, yet I had planted you as a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. And the parable, the picture that's being painted, is very, very simple. God did everything he could to ensure that his vineyard would produce good grapes, that they would produce good fruit, we would say. He protected them, he nurtured them, he blessed them and provided for them. But according to the end of verse 2, they brought forth wild grapes. Now, it wasn't that they didn't produce fruit. No, they produced fruit, but it was bad fruit. It was wild grapes. And interestingly enough, Jesus uses a very similar parable or a a picture, we might say, in John chapter 15 regarding you and I. 
You see, in John chapters 13 through 15, we have a section of Scripture called the Upper Room Discourse, though not all of it's in the Upper Room and not all of it's a discourse. Uh, But in John chapter 14, Jesus, in verse 31, and the disciples leave the Upper Room, presumably there on Mount Zion. And they are making their way across to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus, of course, would uh, be arrested and subsequently crucified. And no doubt, they would have taken the shortest path from Mount Zion to the Mount of Olives, which cuts diagonally across the Temple Mount area. Now, that becomes pretty interesting. Because according to Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, he tells us that on the doors of the temple were giant clusters of golden grapes, a representation of Israel, God's vineyard. Man, these giant grape clusters represent the the fruit that Israel was to produce. And many believe They were walking right in front of the Temple Mount, uh, the doors to the Temple on the Temple Mount, when Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. In other words, Jesus is saying Look at the doors of the temple. That represents Israel. They were supposed to bear good fruit, but they did not. They bore wild grapes, bad fruit. And Jesus says, I'm the true vine. And he points to the importance of abiding in him. And boy, what a powerful picture that paints for us. Because we too are to be bearing fruit in our lives. Now, the problem is, we try to bear fruit in our own strength or our own power. Which is very ironic, as you look at the vineyards all around us out here. You don't see the, the vines, you know, out there in the fields thinking, mm, mm, straining and struggling to produce fruit. And all of a sudden, ah, oh, good, there's a grape, you know. No, they just abide on the vine. Jesus is the vine. And when we abide in Christ, we too will bear much fruit. It speaks of the life we live, the actions. You know, Paul kind of picked up on this same idea in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, he said the fruit of the Spirit is what? Yeah, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, I've heard pastors talk about Galatians 5.22 and lay out all these different fruits of the Spirit, and it, it makes a wonderful outline. Unfortunately, it's totally wrong. There's only one fruit of the Spirit. That attributive noun fruit is singular, and the noun and the preposition agrees with the noun in number and gender. It's not the fruits, plural, of the Spirit are love, joy, peace. No, it's the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love. There's only one fruit of the Spirit. These other eight adjectives are just that. They describe the byproduct of love. So for you and I, we recognize the importance of abiding in Christ so that the fruit of love may flow from our hearts and our lives. Well, this section goes on. Let's come to the second thing about the parable about God's vineyard. Number one, it involves the care for his vineyard. But the second thing involves the condemnation of his vineyard in verses 3 through 6. The condemnation of his vineyard. Uh, 
in verse 3 of Isaiah 5. It goes on, he says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Well, the answer is nothing. God did all he could. He blessed them richly. But they still didn't produce good fruit. Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? Now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it to waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. So the condemnation of his vineyard. And this, of course, points to and speaks of the destruction of Israel, if you will, how it will be laid waste. No doubt a a prophecy looking forward to both kingdoms, uh, the ten northern tribes that are called Israel, of course, will go into captivity under the Assyrian king Shalamazar, who was uh, the king that led the siege against the northern kingdom. And of course, uh, Sargon II would conclude it in 722 BC, when the northern kingdom of Israel was taken into Assyrian captivity. And then the two southern tribes called Judah, they, of course, would go into captivity as well. But under the king of Babylon, who was Nebuchadnezzar, some 136 years later in 586 B.C. And I think the whole point here is pretty simple but pretty serious. Because they turned their back on God, they weren't abiding in God, the condemnation came, and the captivity laid waste. Kind of interesting because Jesus says the same thing about us in John chapter 15. In verse 6 of John 15, Jesus said, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Wow. So you and I see the importance of abiding in Christ. Now, (laughs) it's important to abide in Christ for our eternal life. There's no doubt about that. But it's equally important to abide in Christ for our temporal life, for every aspect of life. Man, abiding in Christ. Because if we don't, If we stop abiding in Christ, we're going to be like that branch that's cut off, withered, gathered, and thrown into the fire and burned. Well, this brings us to the third and final thing in this first section, dealing with the parable about God's vineyard. We've looked at the care for his vineyard, the condemnation of his vineyard. Now, number three and finally, it involves the clarification about his vineyard. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, we have a clarification about his vineyard. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. In verse 7, Isaiah said, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. Now again, uh, Isaiah probably is including the northern tribe called Israel, or he is speaking of it as Israel's, as a nation as a whole specifically speaking to Judah. Either way it fits. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. The idea is he looked for righteousness, but behold, weeping. So here we see the clarification about God's vineyard as it pertains to verses 1 and 2. Now, I think for you and me, the point becomes pretty simple, yet very powerful. Are we producing fruit in our lives? Let me rephrase. Apparently, we all are producing fruit in our lives. The question is, what kind of fruit is it? Is it good fruit or bad fruit? 
Are we producing justice or oppression, according to verse 7? Righteousness or weeping, according to verse 7? Hey, this is a time for us to look at our own lives. We should examine our own hearts and our own fruit, if you will. (laughs) In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, he said, let each man examine himself. Man, we need to look at our own hearts, our own lives, and see what kind of fruit we are producing. Well, let's come to the second section. We said there were only three. The first section involved the parable about God's vineyard. Now, this second section involves the pronouncement against God's vineyard. The pronouncement against God's vineyard. That's in verses 8 through 23. And each pronouncement against Judah is recognized by this little word, woe. Woe. Uh, In verse 8, it says, woe. Down in verse 11, woe. Down in verse 18, woe. It's the Hebrew word, oi. In my Hebrew Bible, it says, oi. (laughs) Oi, 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 they. Uh, So the oi, or the woe. Now, this is a pronouncement of judgment or woes against Judah, and there are six of them. Number one, the first woe is against the sin of greed. The sin of greed. Look at verses 8 through 10. In verse 8 of Isaiah 5, it says, Woe or oi to those who join house to house, who add field to field, till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. (laughs) Sounds like Temecula. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without inhabitant. For ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. Now, in verse 8, Isaiah deals with the sin of greed or greedy people, those who accumulate wealth, accumulate land, accumulate houses. Now, the nation of Israel wasn't supposed to do that. In fact, when God brought the children of Israel into the promised land with Joshua, according to Joshua chapter 13 through verse through chapter 21, The land was allotted to the 12 tribes of Israel, though two and a half tribes stayed on the east side of the Jordan, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. But all of the land was divvied up according to the tribes. Now, over a course of time, uh, people got in debt. They sold land to pay for the debt, and all of this was legitimate and okay. However, According to Leviticus chapter 25, God established what he called the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, all the land, all the houses, all the possessions were to revert back to its original owner. The problem is that Israel wasn't doing that. They disobeyed God's word or the year of Jubilee. And and as a result of that, it brought great famine. We just read that in verses 9 and 10. Notice in verse 10, it says, 10 acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. Now, one bath is about six gallons, and 10 acres of grapes should yield about 4,520 gallons of juice. So we're talking about a great famine. In fact, he says, one homer of seed shall yield one ephah. Now a homer is about eight bushels or 10 ephah. The point is whatever crops you planned on sowing or reaping rather, it will be about one twelfth of what you sowed. And I think the point here is twofold. (laughs) Number one, it deals with the sin of greed. Now, obviously, there's not a problem with owning a lot of land, a lot of homes, and being very wealthy. That's not the problem. The problem is not being content with what we have. 
The problem is always wanting more. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with having a plan and a five-year plan or goals or ambitions and working hard to, to, to provide and to, to, to get stuff. I mean, obviously, that's not a problem. But the problem is when we're not content with the stuff that God's given us. I think it all boils down to contentment. You know, Paul talked about that, by the way, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. He said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in, whether I've got it all or whether I've got nothing at all. <laughs> I've learned to be content. And the problem with the lack of contentment is we always end up empty. You see the, the picture that's being painted in verses 8, 9, and 10? In verse 8, it deals with greedy people. Verses 9 and 10, it deals with great famine. And any time we're greedy, we'll always want more. We'll never have enough. We're always striving for more. Just how much? Just a little bit more. Oh, really? You see, the problem we have is that in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, Paul said that we're created in futility. We're created with an emptiness. In fact, in Ecclesiastes 3.11, the Bible says that God has put eternity into our hearts. So we have this big hole in our heart, in our spirit, in our soul, we might say. And the problem is we try to fill it with the things of the world. And we always end up empty. Because only Jesus Christ can fill that void. Only Jesus Christ can satisfy the hunger of the, the soul and the spirit, of the heart, we might say. And if we're looking to the world and the things of the world to bring satisfaction, to bring fulfillment, we'll always end up empty. So the first woe is the sin of greed. Number two, the second woe is the sin of drunkenness. The sin of drunkenness. Uh, look at verses 11 through 17. In verse 11 of Isaiah 5, he says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and flute and wine are in their feast, but they do not regard the work of the Lord. In other words, all they're doing is partying and getting drunk, nor consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, verse 13, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable, honorable men are famished and their multitude dry up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol, or literally the grave, has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down, each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. So here we see the sin of drunkenness, if you will, the problem of alcohol and alcoholism. Chances are many of us uh, know somebody or have experienced this problem ourselves. The danger and the destructiveness of alcohol and, in, and the enemy uses it in a powerful way to bring us down. As mentioned in verse 12, the harps and the strings, the tambourine. I mean, it's just, you know, hey, let's party kind of a thing. But ultimately, it brings destruction. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Read Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35. That's a big section that deals with that. You know, <laughs> over the years, I have not had one person come into my office and say, Hey, Clark! Man, I am so excited. You know, ever since I started drinking booze, man, my life is awesome. I mean, I am just, I wish I would have found alcohol a lot sooner. You know, I've not had one person tell me that. But I cannot tell you how many times I've had people come into my office and say, Clark, I've blown it. I've lost everything. 
my wife, my kids, my job, my health. I've lost it all. You know, for you, Paul said in Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Boy, what a contrast that makes. Now, for you and I as believers, (laughs) it's not can I, but should I. You can do whatever you want. The question is, should I? For you and I, (laughs) there should be a huge difference between us and the world in how we live our lives and where we go and what we do. You see, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, he said, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Now, we're to be set apart. We're to be consecrated from the Lord. Can I do this? Can I do that? Yeah, of course you can, but should I? That's the question. Now, look at the contrast in verse, 17, or verse 16. Look at the contrast. It says, but, <laughs> but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lamb shall feed in their pastures, and in the waste places the fat ones, or the fatlings, the full-grown lambs, strangers shall eat. Boy, what a contrast. God is holy. God is consecrated. God is set apart. And so too it should be with us. Why? Well, Because according to verse 16, there's going to be judgment. It's the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. God's going to judge everybody. In fact, all judgment, John 5, 22, has been given to the Son. You say, Clark, are you sure everybody's going to be judged? Oh, yes, no doubt about it. All non-believers will be judged before the great white throne of judgment in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And all believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. You say, well, what are we going to be judged on as believers? Well, that's a good question. Presumably, we're going to be judged on the motive behind our actions. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 13. He said, every man's work will be tried as by fire to see what sort or manner it is of. So we should always do the right thing. Please don't misunderstand. But we need to make sure we do the right thing for the right reason. Because ultimately, that's what will be judged. Number three. Let's come to the third woe. Is everybody okay? Don't worry. It gets worse. (laughs) the third woe is the sin of doubt the sin of doubt look at verses 18 and 19 woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope that say let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the holy one of Israel draw near to come that we may know it In other words, in verse 18, they're all tied up in sin. And in verse 19, they doubt that God is going to judge them for it. This is the sin of doubt. And by the way, this is the exact same sin that the people had in Jesus' time. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, they were saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So that's what was happening about 740 B.C., the sin of doubt. That was happening 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day, the sin of doubt. And you know as well as I do, it's the same sin that's happening today with many people. They're living their lives the way They want to live. They're living a life of sin, thinking, well, God hasn't come in 2,000 years. He's not going to come tomorrow. I'm okay. Well, you know, I have plenty of time before God comes. Oh, really? James 4.14 says, our life's a vapor. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. (laughs) I was praying with a dear saint who presumably only has a few days to live. 
<laughs> and I said, well, I'll see you in heaven. I said, because, you know, I have to drive home today, so I might actually beat you there. <laughs> hey, look, tomorrow's promised to no man. And people are living in a very dangerous place being tied up with sin, thinking that God isn't going to come and God isn't going to judge. Number four. The fourth woe is the sin of perversion. The sin of perversion. Look at verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and who call good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for for bitter, the sin of perversion. Boy, everybody perverts everything. Very sad and tragic that over 2,740 years later, after Isaiah prophesied this, uh, things aren't getting better. In fact, they're getting worse. I would never imagine that I would be seeing what I'm seeing in my lifetime. When society in general, elected officials and people as a whole look at violence, rioting, looting, stealing, and pillaging as okay, where they approve it, they even endorse it, but boy, going to church, school, or work, nope, that's illegal, can't do that. God help us all. Listen, we live in upside down world. Talk about the sin of perversion. Exactly what verse they're calling evil good and good evil. They're calling darkness light and light darkness. Now on one hand, this just grieves the far out of me. But on the other hand, <laughs> it blesses me too because I know that the end is near. That Jesus is coming for His church. And that you and I need to be busy about his business. Number five, real quickly, let's come to the fifth woe, and that's the sin of pride. The sin of pride. Look at verse 21. Isaiah 5, 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, the prideful, and prudent in their own sight. Boy, the sin of pride. Now, of course, this doesn't apply to any of us, but people at other churches probably should get the tape. Uh, <laughs> You know, Proverbs sixteen eighteen says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Lord willing, uh, when we get to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, we're going to look at the five I wills of Satan, which is all pride. Which is a big, big topic. And Lord willing, we'll see that in chapter 14. Stay tuned. Number six. The sixth and final woe is the sin of bribes. The sin of bribes. Look at verses 22 and 23. It says, Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Now the mighty and the valiant probably speak of those in authority, those judges and governmental officials. And because they're intoxicated, because of their drinking, they're susceptible to bribes. They can be bought off, we might say. Now, of course, uh, these are two things that you and I need to be very careful regarding, obviously. Well, let's come to the third and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. We've looked at the parable about God's vineyard. We've looked at the pronouncements against God's vineyard. Now, number three and finally, let's take a look at the punishment for God's vineyard. That's in verses 24 through 30. The punishment for God's vineyard, as God calls other nations from afar to come and take them into captivity. Take a look. Verse 24, Isaiah 5 says, Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be rottenness and their blossom will 
ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuge in the midst of the streets. For all, his, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out. He will lift up a banner to the nations from afar and will whistle to them from the end of the earth. Surely they shall come with speed swiftly. No one will be weary or stumble among them. In other words, these foreign armies are going to come like a, a rushing wind. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt of their loins be loose, nor the strap of their sandals be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves will seem like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. The roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. They will carry it away safely, and no one will deliver or deliver them, obviously. In that day, they will roar against them, these enemies against Israel, like the roaring of a sea. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened by clouds. Now, God's going to summon these nations from afar to take his people captive because according to the end of verse 24, they despised the word of the Holy One. And as we've mentioned, this, this will happen. Uh, the northern kingdom in 722, the southern kingdom in 586. And all of that is a result of them rejecting the word of the Lord. And you know, this is one reason why we place such great importance on teaching the word of God. Man, whenever we reject God's word, whenever we make light of God's word, there's going to be problems. Never forget, I had a fellow come in my office and he was going through a situation and I, I, God gave me the perfect verse for it. I opened it, I read it, I closed my Bible and, and I'll never forget his response. He said, well, I'll pray about that. I said, Excuse me? You'll pray about it? God said it. There's nothing to pray about. God said it, we just do it. Hello? <laughs> you had me worried there for a moment. God's Word cleanses us. Psalm 119, verse 5 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your Word. That's what Jesus said in John 15, 3, You are already clean because of the Word which I spoke to you. It's God's Word that does it. God's Word is powerful, Hebrews 4.12. It's sharp, it's powerful. Man, it divides the soul and the spirit, the bone and the marrow. That's how powerful God's Word is. God's Word keeps us from sinning, according to Psalm 119, verse 11. David said, Your Word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Why is God's Word so powerful? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's because the word of God is Jesus Christ John 1.14 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father full of grace and full, is tru full of truth man our love for Jesus Christ is seen in direct proportion to our love for his word we say we love Jesus right on but do we love His Word? They're one and the same. That's why the Word of God is so powerful. And when we reject or despise the Word of God, according to verse 24, we can not only be carried about by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4.14, but by the woes of sin. Father, we are so grateful for Your Word that teaches us, trains us, <laughs> leads us, guides us, and directs us. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And Lord, we pray that your word would sink past our heads into our hearts, that we would truly have a hunger and a desire for your word. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, 
you would increase that hunger, increase that desire each and every day. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors and the brothers and the sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you. And I do pray that as you continue this week, man, it would be a glorious week, a week that God's Spirit would fall upon you in a fresh and powerful way, that He would lead you, guide you, and direct you. Just do a great and mighty work in and through you. God bless you all. I love you. Have a great rest of the week in the Lord.